Hello, Destiny Kids! Welcome to another week of our treasure hunt for the greatest treasure in the world! So far, we have gotten through the mountains of forgetfulness, the quicksand of unthankfulness, the swamp of unfriendliness, the great lonely desert, thunderstorm of confusion, the geyser of greatness. And this week, we're gonna bring little Bible child into the trash heap of heartlessness. Doesn't that just sound awful? I think that sounds awful. Good thing Bible child has the destiny kids with her. Him? We don't know if Bible child's a boy or a girl. Now let's review. What is a destiny kid? We are kids of value. We have hope for the future. We are people of influence. We are children destiny. So don't worry Bible child, we'll get you through the trash heap of heartlessness. <clears throat> Sounds awful. This is a very cool treasure of an animal not extinct. How many of you have heard of the praying mantis? Praying mantis are pretty common around here, at least here in Canada. This mantis that I'm going to show you is not to be found in Canada. Let me introduce you to the orchid mantis. What do you think that looks like? Doesn't it look like a flower? Well, an orchid is a flower and that's how this animal gets its name. They are some of the best camouflagers in the animal kingdom. Camouflage is when you can blend in with your surroundings. These absolutely do. In fact, when they were discovered, a man was hiking through a forest in West Java and he thought he saw some very pretty flowers. And as he stopped on his hike to watch, the pretty flower reached out and grabbed a bug and ate it. Because it wasn't a flower at all, it was a mantis. And then he discovered that he was actually looking at an insect. But he had been staring at it for a while and it had been perfectly still. And the whole time he had been staring at it, he thought he was looking at a flower until it suddenly moved. A neat thing about the orchid mantis is it can change its color just a little bit, very slowly. When something new comes into their environment, they can change their color to try to blend in better. They can go from a really pretty pink and they can fade all the way into a dark brown like a branch instead of an orchid. That's a very clever trick. The orchid mantis, as a general rule, eats bugs, but it has been known to eat things like spiders, lizards, even scorpions. Now the orchid mantis can bite people. They're big enough to bite people and it does hurt a little bit, but it doesn't damage people. They don't have any venom in them. What happens when an orchid mantis bites you? Well, it's kind of like a mosquito bite. Get a little bit of an irritation on your skin, then you're fine. A neat little thing that the orchid mantis does to help it camouflage. Sometimes it'll sway a little bit from side to side very slowly. And the reason it does that is because it's trying to look like a flower in the breeze and it fools other insects like butterflies which go, oh, a pretty flower, and they fly by and then it grabs out and it eats them. Well, we have had quite an adventure on our where is God journey, our hunt to find God because he's the greatest treasure. We've been talking a lot about how we can find God, where we can find God, when we can find God. In week four, we said we can find God in our everyday lives. Finding God when we're doing basic things that we don't even think about. Things that, you know, you wouldn't think, hey, this is a good God moment. Like, you know, when I'm mowing my lawn, when I'm washing my dishes, those are, you know, like, yeah, here's a good God moment. But they can be. Any moment in your life can be a really good God moment. This week, we're talking through finding God everywhere. And Bible Child is right now in the trash heap of heartlessness. What an awful place to be. First of all, who'd want to be in a trash heap? And second of all, who'd want to be heartless? I know I wouldn't. But it's something a lot of Christians deal with. And not just Christians. People all around the world deal with heartlessness. If you are blessed to live in a country like Canada where you are cared for, where your government takes care of your basic needs, and where there are laws protecting you as a child, you are very blessed indeed. 
because there are a lot of places all around the world where that is not true. And, and God calls on people like us to reach across the world with the things that he has given us and to bless others. I think it's a beautiful story. And it happened in the country of Great Britain after World War II. After World War II, the people in Great Britain were so hungry. And in order to make sure that everybody had enough food, the government provided food stamps. So you had a little booklet and it said how much sugar you could get for your family, how much bread you could get for your family, and it made sure that the people had food. And the great thing about this story is while the people in Great Britain were living off of food stamps, the government was sending food to the Netherlands. So it's not that they didn't have food for their people, they did. But what they said was they looked across the world and they said, our allies in the Netherlands are starving because the people in the Netherlands were digging up their tulip bulbs and eating the root, the, the bulb of the tulip. That's how hungry they were. So the people of Great Britain had to do with a little bit less so that the people of the Netherlands wouldn't die. And that is how you don't end up in the trash heap of heartlessness. Because you say to yourself, I can help those people. You really have no idea how much you are blessed until you have traveled to another country around the world and you see how they live and you'll see just how blessed you truly are. Our treasure of a lost city found. This is a fun one because the name of the city is Ciudad Perdida, which actually means lost city. <laughs> this city is found in Colombia. Ciudad Perdida was built in 800 AD, so over 1200 years ago. It was known at the time as Teyuna, because it wasn't always known as a lost city because it wasn't lost, right? People were living in it. The lost city of Ciudad Perdida was hidden from the outside world and forgotten about by most people for over 300 years. The interesting thing is the local population, they knew the city was there, but it wasn't a city anymore. It had fallen into ruin and it was unoccupied and the jungle of Colombia had grown around it and hidden it from the outside world. So the people of the area, they didn't think there was anything interesting about that. But when it was found again, all of a sudden it became a big deal. And archeologists and historians and people from all around the world would travel to Ciudad Perdida to try and understand about the culture and the people of the time. The country of Colombia has gone through a lot of hard times. It has gone through three massive economic shifts. So the first one was farming of marijuana. Now you may or may not have heard of marijuana, but marijuana has been an illegal drug around the world for a very long time. And only recently here in Canada has marijuana become legal for very specific uses. But when it was illegal around the world, the farmers growing marijuana would sell marijuana for illegal drug use. The second economic boom happened when they started to farm another illegal substance called coca. Coca is what is used to make cocaine, another illegal drug. The finding of Ciudad Perdida opened Colombia up to something brand new called tourism. And when tourism happens, then the people start to get wealthier. The only way to get to Ciudad Perdida is to take a super long 47 kilometer hike. You have to go up and down four different mountains to get there, and it takes several days. There's 1,200 steps you have to climb just to get up there. This week, I'm going to share with you another super famous story from the Bible. And if you've never heard it before, don't worry about it. If you have, enjoy it again. This is from the book of Luke, chapter 10. It's a story that Jesus is telling. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. 
They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the street. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then Jesus asked, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus replied, good, now you go and do likewise. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. A Samaritan, <laughs> that word has come to mean something so different now, but a Samaritan was a person from Samaria. They weren't Israelites. And when he saw the wounded man, he would have recognized that that man was an Israelite because they didn't dress the same way. They didn't have the same uh, uh, customs regarding how they shape their beards and wear their hair. All that was different. So just looking at the man, even though he had no clothes, he would have been able to recognize that that man was an Israelite. And Israelites and Samarians, they didn't like each other. But instead of saying, ha, that Israelite got what he deserved, what did he do? He said, there's a hurt person. I'm going to go help. That's what Jesus calls us to do. When people around us are suffering, we are supposed to put ourselves aside. We are supposed to inconvenience ourselves to help others. It's a teaching of Jesus. And sometimes you will be on the side of the Samaritan. You will be the one giving help. But there will be a time in your life when you'll be on the side of the Israelite. Something will be wrong in your life and you will need help. And you should hope that God sends you a Samaritan. This is our treasure, not gold. A king came to the public eye when she was a child because she was what was known as a prodigy. A prodigy is somebody who, at a very young age, acquires a very impressive skill. A cane is an artist. A cane was homeschooled. One thing that her mother was able to teach her was three different languages. I mean, she may never have become a great mathematician, but she spoke three languages and she taught that to her daughter. When a cane was very young, she started to tell her mother and father about a man that she would sometimes see. Not, not like, oh, I saw him walking down the street, but in her mind, she could see him. And she would tell her mother and father about how much peace this man would bring to her heart. And her mother and father had no idea what she was talking about because a Cain wasn't raised in a Christian home. Her parents were atheists. That means they didn't believe in God. And a Cain kept seeing this man in her mind. And when she was eight years old, she painted this picture, Prince of Peace. She would tell her parents about the, how this man would encourage her and say to her, you can do it, I'll be with you along the way. She saw these beautiful images of Jesus. She painted a lot of images of Jesus before she even knew who Jesus was. Now, I gotta tell you, that speaks to me about how real Jesus truly is. In her heart and in her mind, she saw this man and named him <laughs> she named him the Prince of Peace. She has a very varied skill too. A lot of artists paint either impressionistic, realistic, there's all sorts of different styles of painting, but she paints different styles because her gift is from God. At one point, her parents tried to send her to a public school and she did so badly. She, her teacher would give her a coloring page and she would either turn the page over and draw her own thing, or she would change the lines. And her teacher got so angry. She said, you made your own lines. Why don't you color in the lines? 
And Akane said, but the lines are wrong. <laughs> Once her painting started to sell for a lot of money, she actually would travel around the world with her family and encourage and counsel people who were struggling with their gifts. She's only 27 years old now. She has created over 200 paintings. She has written 800 poems or stories or books. She's still very young. 27 might not seem young to you, but it's pretty young and she is very famous. And she started as a child and she, she just, God called her. Have you ever thought about how huge this planet is? How many places there are? I mean, not just countries, but also types of land. There are mountains, forests, swamps, deserts, islands, ocean, so many different places, so many different types of places around the world. And in all those places, you're going to find interesting people, different types of animals, plants that only exist in those places. The world is fascinating and it's a little bit mind blowing when you think about the fact that God is in all those different types of places. I mean, your brain just goes, I could be in a desert. No, nah, there's my God. I could be in a blizzard up in the Arctic. There's my God. I could be on a, an island out in the middle of an ocean during a storm. There's my God. I think that's really great that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Bible says it doesn't matter how high I go, how low I go, how far from people I go, I cannot escape God. God is always there. So we find God everywhere, which, you know, when you think about it, means that our treasure hunt should be pretty easy, right? I mean, if we're hunting for the greatest treasure in the world, and the truth is that the greatest treasure is everywhere, why do people have so much trouble finding God? Yeah, I think if we were to go back to our first week, we find the answer to that question. They have trouble finding God because they don't look. They don't look with all their hearts. Sometimes people think they already know the answer. Like our story of a cane, the little girl, her family didn't believe in God. And God spoke to her as a child. And she created these beautiful drawings of Jesus and stories in the Bible that she had never heard. So even when you're surrounded by people who don't believe in God, God's there. We've gone on quite a little journey together. This is what your map should look like so far. We started out in the mountains of forgetfulness. We went through the quick sand of thankless, thank of the quick sand of unthankfulness, the swamp of unfriendliness, the great lonely desert thunderstorm of confusion where we did our fluffy cloud. The geyser of greatness. This week, we're in the trash heap of heartlessness, where we never want to be, right? We've talked enough about it. You know you never want to be there. You want to be willing and ready to give to others who are in need. And finding and giving to others in need is a way to find God. So, we're just going to put that disc down there. Now, on your disc, You'll see that there are little band-aids, right? That's because one way that we help others around the world is by providing medical care. Band-aids, bandages, antibiotics, all those things. But another way that you can help people around the world is to provide money. Another way is to provide yourself. You travel to that country and help them. Our church has a missionary who lives in Ukraine and he went to help orphans. So there are lots of needs around the world. And I would like you to think of something that you think of when you think about helping people in another country. It could be anything. You could draw a hammer if you think about building things to help them. You could draw a stethoscope. If you think about medical care, you could draw a loony, which here in Canada replaced the dollar bills. You could draw any of those things. But think of something that comes to your mind 
when you think of helping people around the world. And you are just gonna draw that right in the middle. And then you're going to put this on week seven, the trash heap of heartlessness, to show we find God everywhere. We need to go two places in order to find him there and to always have an open heart that's ready to help others. All right, so we are more than halfway through our class. There's only six left and at the end, we will find the greatest treasure in the world. Here is our treasure of an animal lost. The Cape Verde giant skink. Yes, I said skink, not skunk. Lots of people confuse the two. Skinks are actually found all around the world. We have skinks here in Ontario. In Ontario, we have something called the five-lined skink, but they're usually a lot smaller. Now, the Cape Verde giant skink, as I'm sure you can tell by its name, was quite a large skink. The giant skink would grow to be a little more than 30 centimeters, so that's about a ruler, right? 30 centimeters. That's just head to almost end. Then when you add the tail on the end, you end up with a much bigger animal. You know, a really interesting thing about the skink is it was hunted and hunting was a big contribution to its extinction. They used to hunt it for something called skink oil. Now I researched and researched and researched trying to find out what skink oil was for. One of the main uses that I found was that skink oil was used to relieve itchiness. Now in Canada, we have a weed that grows all over the place that can relieve itchiness. It's called the broadleaf plantain. You could pick that, it wouldn't make any creature grow extinct. But you see, as with so many island creatures, the only place this animal was found was on these islands. But the problem is like, once they're gone, they're gone. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just hunting. As usual, the people who came to the islands brought animals with them that were not indigenous to those islands and they hunted the skink. Rats, which stowed away on the ships, and cats. And the rats and the cats, the people who were hunting, and as they started to build towns on these islands, they would cut down the forests. And so again, loss of habitat led to the extinction of the giant skink. An interesting thing to know about history is various cultures have, instead of building prisons on their, their land, have taken convicts, people who are convicted of committing a crime, and shipped them off and just dropped them off on islands. And that's where they live or die and the people don't care. So it's not like, okay, you serve five years here in prison, then we let you out, hopefully you've changed your ways. It's like, oh, you're convicted of this crime, we're gonna put you on a boat, we're gonna sail you across the ocean, we're gonna drop you off, and you could live or you could die. So that was another thing that happened. They dropped off these convicts on the island, and these convicts had to find a way to survive. And one thing they did to survive was they ate skink. When skinks started to become extinct, extinct skinks, they did try to breed them in captivity. We talked about that when we were talking about the axolotl. Axolotls breed very well in captivity, no problem. Skinks did not. They couldn't get them to breed and create enough of a population to save their species from going extinct. We've been talking today about not getting caught in the trash heap of heartlessness. And we've been talking about helping other people, having a godly heart that wants to reach out and make life better for somebody else and finding God all around the world and recognizing that even in the darkest places where the people are suffering so horribly that God is there. In 2011, there was a tsunami off the coast of Japan. 
when the, when the wave from the tsunami rose 133 feet into the air and came crashing over the islands of Japan, it went six miles inland, destroying homes and families and businesses. But one of the scariest tragedies was the damage it did to a nuclear plant. The Fukushima nuclear plant was damaged by the tsunami and there were meltdowns and a re massive release of radioactive material. <laughs> when that happened, people from all over the world rose up and they sent money and they sent medical supplies and they sent people to rebuild as much as they could after that. There's so many things in this world that make life hard on other people. Some of them are called natural disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding. When those things happen, thank God that there is international coverage. So now, as opposed to hundreds of years ago, now people all around the world know when something that, like that happens and people all around the world rush to help. There's an organization called Doctors Without Borders and this is an organization that sends doctors and nurses and surgeons to places where people need medical help. Churches send teams of people down. Now maybe, maybe you're not a doctor. Maybe you're not a construction worker or an electrician. But when people are desperate for help, there is something you can do. The Canadian Red Cross sends people and medical supplies down when people are suffering blood gets sent down. Just be aware that there are people out there suffering and keep your heart open to helping them and you will not fall into the trash heap of heartlessness. Be willing to do with a little bit less in your life just so somebody else can survive and you will not get stuck in the trash heap of heartlessness and you will bless somebody else in the world. Hi, here we are at our scripture wall. Another week, another amazing scripture. Here's our scripture from this week. This is from Matthew 25, 40. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. That's a great scripture because it tells you every time you reach out and help someone else, you are blessing God. <laughs> Who doesn't want to bless God? Let's look at our other scriptures. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. A friend loves at all times. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. In our scripture again, our new one, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. I love that because I think in some ways it's so, so easy to bless God and thank him for all the things that he's done for us because... All I have to do is take care of somebody else. All right, pop this up on our scripture wall. I think we're almost ready to get Bible Child out of the trash heap of heartlessness. This is something that I drew. It represents a flag of a country called Monaco. Have you ever heard of Monaco? Probably not. Monaco is the second smallest country in the world. The smallest country in the world is Vatican City, and as its name might indicate, it's one city, but it's independent as its own nation. This country, this country of Monaco, is a little bit more than two square kilometers inside. It sits on the border of France, and it has about a little bit more than 38,000 people who live in that two square kilometer range. It's considered one of the wealthiest and most expensive countries in the world now. And because it is so small, it would be very hard 
for the country of Monaco to defend itself against uh, an invading force. So France actually takes care of them and makes sure that all the other countries know that Monaco is protected by France. There are lots of countries around the world that you might have never heard of. Have you ever heard of Namibia? Have you ever heard of Sierra Leone? Have you ever heard of Vanuatu or Andorra, Malaysia, Qatar, Mongolia, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan? Are any of these countries familiar to you? There are over 200 countries around the world. You can find God in all of them. Even in the, and, and they're not all the same. Some of these countries are ruled by monarchs, kings, queens, princes, princesses. Some are ruled by emperors, dictators, prime ministers, presidents. There are all sorts of leaders and governments. In some of these places, the people are happy and safe. In some of these places, the people are fleeing for their lives because of the wars that rage around them. With over 200 countries, it doesn't matter where you go because you can find God in any of them. From the largest country in the world, which is Russia, to the smallest countries in the world, like Vatican City and Monaco. In 1992, when Eric Laws set out across the field, he wasn't going on a treasure hunt. After he had retired from work, he was given a gift called a metal detector. And this allows you to pass the device over the ground and it'll tell you if there's metal underground. So he took his metal detector over to the Hawks in the field to try to find a lost hammer. And when his metal detector went off, he got very excited and he started digging, but he didn't find a hammer. What he found was Roman coins. After a couple shovels full of gold and silver, he stopped and he immediately went and called the police and the local archaeological society. And when they got there, they were so excited because they pulled up over 60 pounds of gold and silver, over 15,000 Roman coins. And it taught them so much. This is the neat thing about archaeology. When you find things, in the ground, you can learn so much about the society that lived there. Last week, we talked about the hidden city of Derinkuyu, where Christians would hide when the Ottoman Empire said that Christianity was illegal. Now, we're going the other way. The Roman Empire says Christianity is the only religion, and then people start fighting and hiding and being scared. So very wealthy people would get afraid, and they would bury their treasure in the ground. One really cool artifact that was found is a pepper pot. Now this pepper pot is super cool because it has holes in the base where you can shake out your pepper. And it also told archeologists a lot about the people of the time. You can look at the, the outfit that this woman is wearing and it shows you, you know, what was a popular thing to wear back then. In fact, the only way to get pepper back then was to trade with the country of India. So that told the archaeologists, hey, these people traded with India. After the archaeologists had come, taken all the gold and silver out of the ground, Eric Laws was paid for his find. The British government gave him 1.75 million British pounds, which is more than 3 million Canadian dollars. Oh, and he did find his hammer. All right, let's rescue Bible Child from the trash heap of heartlessness. No worries, Bible Child. We have figured out how to not get stuck here. So come on out. We're going to put up our disc that we made. I put a little dollar symbol on mine to show that one way we can help people is by sending money and some band-aids around it as well. There you go. And this is to remind us we can find God anywhere. We can find God in the smallest countries, the biggest countries. We can find God in places where people are wealthy, in places where people are poor. In order to find God in those places, though, you have to go to those places. And And we learned about how important it is to go and help people. 
And when you go and help people, you will find God. Because remember, whatever you do for the least among the people, so the people who have the least, you're doing it for God. You're blessing God when you help others and take care of others all around the world. So Bible Child is going to be happy not to be stuck there anymore. Although Bible Child won't be rejoicing too much because next week Bible Child's going to get stuck in the bog of fear. Sorry, Bible Child. But we're going to get Bible Child out, right? You won't be stuck. You won't be stuck in the bog of fear. Well, we're going to wrap up our week. And so let's just review what we've learned so far by looking in our treasure box. Week one, we find God when we look for him. To remind us to do that, we have a map. Looking at a map helps us find a treasure. Looking for God helps us find him. Week two, we find God in the relationships of our family. So I have a picture of my grandma Marjorie reminding us that all good and perfect things come from God and all the good things that our family will do, that's from God too. And we find God when we treat our family members well and when they treat us well too. Week three, we find God through our friendships. There's my friendship bracelet made by my friend, Danielle, reminding us to choose the kinds of friends that will encourage us to do what is right and to be the kind of friend that encourages others. Week four, we find God in our everyday lives. When we do simple, basic things that we don't even think about, we can find God there. I have a little pencil to remind myself when I'm doing something simple, like writing something down. I can find God in that moment. Week five, we find God in his awesome creation. Here's my created tree to remind me that when I look out at nature, I find God there. Last week, we talked about finding God at church. Here's my little tangram church. We find God at church. Remember, churches are full of people. People are flawed. So sometimes churches, sometimes you'll meet people in churches that don't represent God very well, but that's just like everywhere else around the world. You're going to find people at people you're going to find people in the grocery store that don't represent God very well. You're going to find people on the street that don't represent God very well. In a swimming pool. Everywhere. But when you find a godly church where people really want to serve God, you will find God there. And this week, we find God everywhere. Remember, all around the world. So I have, here's the flag of Monaco, to remind me, not everybody is like us here in Canada or wherever you're from and places that are small. Canada is the second largest country in the world. So the size difference between Canada and Monaco is, is massive. But I can find God in the little country of Monaco. I can find God in war-torn countries. I can find God where there have been disasters. I can find God everywhere. And so can you.